Welcome to chapter one. Uh, during this chapter, we're going to talk about some of the foundational ideas of biology. And we're also going to talk about what AP calls the four big ideas. Your book is going to refer to these as biology themes, but these are some of the central ideas that we're going to deal with in biology. So you kind of need to understand them because everything else we cover is going to come back to referring to those basic ideas. So with this, we're going to go through and first start off with the idea of scientific inquiry. What I want to make sure you get from this slide is that when, when you're going through and methodically approaching science, there's several ideas that really are the foundations of scientific understanding. And those ideas are not the scientific method as we think of it. Those ideas revolve around the, the central concept that when you're doing science, you have to do so in an open way. You have to make your results available to other people so they can try and test it themselves. They can try to see if it can be repeated. If it can't be repeated, then we can see that something's wrong. And so by allowing other people to check your work, this is what allows for science to be self-correcting, where other people will try to see if you've made mistakes, and then ultimately if you have, they'll put those mistakes out there so we can then get to the actual truth, not just get biased results. Now, part of this process of getting to the actual truth is that everybody else that's not you should be skeptical of what you're doing. And so we go through this process called falsification where people kind of try to tear your work apart. That's their job as fellow scientists is to try to find weak spots, try to find issues, try to see if they can do it themselves or if something went on that you did not understand so that at the end only the ideas that can survive all this scrutiny survive. And those ideas then are how we can continue to build science and continue to get better, continue to know more. Now there is some general process when you're trying to discuss science and understand it. And so this process you guys may have seen referred to as a scientific method. There's not one perfect way, uh, but with a scientific method there's normally something that you're curious about. And so you're either just going to do an experiment to try to figure out what happens. You might not have a hypothesis in mind. You might just be checking. Uh, but normally if you keep doing experiments, at some point you should start to get a hypothesis about what you think is going to happen, what you think is going on so you can make a prediction about what the results will be. And you can then do the experiments to check your hypotheses to see if they're supported or not. If they are supported, you can repeat the experiment to try and verify that. If they're not supported, you can change your hypothesis because of the new results, and you can test that. But the, none of the stuff in science, none of these experiments, none of these ideas, none of these processes should be a one-off thing. They should be things that you keep doing, and then you then share with other people once you've gotten your results to have them test to see if you're actually doing something correctly. And eventually, if you get enough of your predictions confirmed, you can try to work towards a theory which will be an explanation. So hypothesis is, is usually best described, I'd say, as a prediction. All right. But when we talk about a theory, this is going to be an explanation. So it's similar, but not the exact same thing. And so in many cases, my hypothesis might be that if I eat this type of food, I'll gain weight. But the theory might be me trying to explain exactly what mechanisms are behind this, you know, exactly what metabolic stuff is going on that's making it when I eat this particular substance that I gain weight. And so they're not going to always overlap perfectly. A theory is something with a lot of evidence that backs it up. This is not something one person did. A theory is something that was checked by many scientists, typically over the span of decades, that has all been kind of aligned to say, yes, this is what's going on. Whereas a hypothesis is something that you can come up with, no big deal, uh, and later on will typically be much further verified by other people. And oftentimes your hypothesis might be one part of this overarching theory idea, because theories tend to be broad. Hypotheses tend to be fairly specific. Now, feedback regulation. One of the ideas I want to start bringing up now is this idea of, of homeostasis, which we'll get into a little later too, but also this idea of feedback and control. So this means if something within a living organism changes, we have two different ways fundamentally to respond to that. The first way is negative feedback. This is the most common, where ultimately if something is going up, you say, all right, let's make it go down. Okay, my body temperature went up, I'm going to sweat. So I start sweating, my body temperature goes back down. I eat a bunch of Twinkies, my blood sugar goes up. 
my body releases insulin, which makes my blood sugar go down. That's negative feedback. It opposes whatever change has occurred. This is what helps us stay alive. So we don't start to get warm and just say, warm is awesome, let's go for more of it. And then you die of a fever. Or you're like, oh, cold is awesome, let's go for more of it. You die of hypothermia. We want to make sure that we're in this kind of sweet spot that exists for ourselves chemically to make sure we stay alive. And negative feedback is a huge part of that. If something goes up, initiate something else to make it go down. Now, the opposite of this, which is used occasionally, it's, it's not completely novel, uh, is positive feedback, where you go with the change. This one is, is very useful if you have a set result you're trying to get to, where you're trying to clot a wound. So it starts to clot and your body's like, let's go for this. Let's do lots of clotting so that we ultimately scab it over and protect ourselves. Or you know what? We got this birth thing going on. So let's go with these contractions. Let's do more contractions. Let's do them faster until eventually we get to a child being born. You don't want to stop it and be like, oh, contract, no contractions. We have an end result that we have to have change occur to get to. And so positive feedback, while it doesn't normally exist indefinitely, will occur at least for periods of time to allow us to get to these specific ends. So if something drops, you basically say, let's drop it some more. If something goes up, you say, let's increase it some more. And that will happen in our bodies. But like I said, it's normally over a specific interval of time. We usually it's negative feedback long term that we'll focus on. But in the short term, positive feedback can be very useful. Now, our big ideas, and we've got four of them. This is kind of what wraps up this chapter. I'm going to bring them up and try to knit together these themes for us so we know what's going on. So the first big idea is really revolving around evolution and how life is connected in terms of how it's different and how it's the same. So we have the same genetic code, we have the same method of mutation that occurs in all of us that allows for us to be different. It allows for us to have different structures and these different structures allow for different functions, different jobs, different abilities, and these different structure and functions allow for evolution then to occur where individuals with certain structures and functions do better than individuals with other structures and functions. And so the fact that some individuals can survive and reproduce better with their particular traits, with their particular version of something, allows whole species to change, and in some cases become new species over time. Because we accumulate these differences as mutations occur, and we have something new now that we can use, and if that new thing is better, those individuals that possess it will tend to survive better, have more children that inherit their particular characteristics, and so then they're more successful and this keeps going. And eventually, because our climate changes, you know, the, the geography of the earth will change given enough time, the environment will shift, sometimes too what's good now will stop being good later, and so once again evolution will kick in and whatever's best for that particular environment will start to reproduce better, start to survive better, and so you can see shifts uh, to something new or something that perhaps was popular in the olden days, if you will, a while back, uh, because the environment changed. And so what was good changed with it. So don't think that evolution has like one set goal or that there's one set trait that's always good. This is always in the context of the environment that you're in and understand that environment can change. It can get colder, hotter, wetter, drier, new predators can move in, new prey can move in, and so what's good is not like a definite or absolute forever. Now big idea two is going to be what goes to this idea that we have specific molecules, we are puddles of chemicals, that work together to allow us to live. You know there's a difference between a puddle of chemicals and an alive puddle of chemicals, and that difference is what they're doing. You know, whether or not they're able to carry out the particular chemical reactions that allow them to keep going or if they just kind of degrade into that pool of, of sludge. And so there's going to be a lot of stuff to do with energy here. So this would be molecules like ATP that we've talked about that we see in most organisms, all organisms really. Um, and so we're going to have these ideas of these energy molecules. We'll have things like DNA and proteins that will allow us to carry out the functions that we need so that they're able to get bigger because you need to grow. And then reproduction, especially if you're a single cell organism, really what reproduction is is splitting in two. So you need to grow big enough that you can split in two. So these are kind of tied together, this ability to grow, so that you can then get to reproducing so there's more of you. And ultimately, if you want to live long term, 
to be able to grow and reproduce, you have to have homeostasis or balance. If you don't have this ability to have balance, that's that negative feedback that we just talked about. If you can't do that, you're going to die because it's going to get warm outside, you're going to overheat and die. It's going to get cold out over the night and you'd get too cold, you'd die. You'd eat a meal, have too much sugar in your system, you'd die. You know, there's so many things that we are balancing. We need to have this homeostasis. And we have a bunch of chemicals. Uh, you'll see these might be hormones. They might be what are called local regulators, but signals that go on in our body to detect. You know, our nerve system can detect things that we can respond to by releasing specific chemicals. All of this is part of this chemical symphony that's going on in our bodies to let us stay balanced so we can survive. Without it, we're done for. So this one focuses a lot on those chemical building blocks that we need to maintain balance as well as to grow and reproduce, to make more of them. Now, big idea three is one that's going to tie in this idea of DNA and it's going to tie in the idea of like our nervous system. So this one goes to how we're able to store and retrieve, transmit this idea like our DNA where we store the information that really says who we are, you know, how we're going to function. And then we can pass that on to other generations. So this is a, a we sometimes call vertical, so one generation to the next, transmission of our information so they also can survive, so they also can do the things that we can do. We also have this idea of retrieving, transmitting, respondent information like from our environment. So we can tell if it's cold outside or hot outside or if something's running at, running at us. Uh, we can tell it's raining, you know, we can detect things and respond to them. So if it starts raining, you might go and find shelter. If you're cold, you might go through and either shiver or put clothes on, but we're able to interact with and deal with these changes in our environment. That's what's really tied with all of this. So sometimes when they talk about the characteristics of life, they call this response to stimuli. And when they're talking about characteristics of life, they talk about heredity. So that's really what you're seeing with DNA and the universal code. That's this heredity idea. That's our ability to uh, store information, pass it on, uh, produce children, it's tied in with reproduction. This is critical for us to last long term because individual organisms aren't going to make it forever. But by reproducing, you still have some individuals of a species can keep going and keep going. But within my individual life, I can't change genetically really. I mean, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to evolve personally, but I still am constantly getting information from my environment and I'm constantly responding to it. If I didn't do that, I would die relatively quickly. This ties back to that understanding of homeostasis and how I have to get this information so I can process it so I can stay alive. That's the idea be behind big idea three. Big idea four is going to be biological systems are going to interact and that allows for us to get a lot of these complex characteristics that we have. And this is almost oftentimes referred to as emergent properties, where what this is in simple terms is, is that the sum is greater than the parts. So what this means is none of the individual tissues, the muscle, the nerves, uh, the skin tissues that we have in our body, none of them individually can do what a stomach can do. They can't. It's impossible. But if we mix them together in just the right way, they can now do these characteristics, they can now do these functions that they weren't able to do as one single piece. Just like you're, you have a car, but a motor can't be a car. The tires can't be a car. A seat is not a car. None of the pieces allow you to do the function that an entire car lets you do. It only functions as a car if you put all those pieces together in a specific way. That's really this idea of emergent properties. That's this, ability, this idea that biological systems, when we talk about them, whether it's an individual, whether it's a cell, whether it's a population, a group of individuals, whether it's a whole ecosystem, these things are all interacting to allow things to function. And those interactions are complex and they allow complex things to occur. You know, many organisms need another organism to be present so they can survive. And it may be directly like I eat you, but it could also be that I live in something that you produced. You know, it could also be that I'm eating the waste that you produced. There's lots of stuff that goes on that makes this so complex and so amazing biologically.